where a lot of our communication satellites are, and there's about 300 satellites out there. So these, these satellites then are in the way of potentially harmful radiation, it can affect their electronics, and it can pose a threat to astronauts and, and all of our satellites that are there. So the radiation belt, uh, storm probes, now the Van Allen probes, was the second mission with the Living with the Star program. Pictured here, this is just a couple of images to give the sense of what the Living with the Star program is about. It's the, making the connections between the assets from the sun to the earth that affect life and society. So you can see there astronauts, you can see greenery for, for plants, you can see there are fisheries there, there are power systems. All of these things are affected by space weather, as we call it, affected by these radiation belts. So Joe Kunches later in this presentation is gonna talk about that a little bit more. And the only thing I still want to tell you now is about the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which was the first mission with the Living with the Star program. I'm going to show you a video. This is right after launch where a filament from the sun erupts from the atmosphere of the sun out into space. It carries with it, it's a, it's a coronal mass ejection that's actually headed towards the Earth. And you can see another picture of it here with SOHO, which is an old, one of our older um, satellite assets. And this will show, come back to SDO and show you that again, this filament that bursts out into space. So those happen all the time on the sun, but they're not always directed at Earth. This one was, uh, at least as a glancing blow, and it came to the Earth and our radiation belts exploded with, with things that were happening. And so now I'm going to turn this over to Dan Baker and let him tell you about this remarkable discovery. Thank you, Mona. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk to you today about the science paper that's being published uh, today in the uh, journal uh, Science, actually online, Science Express. I'm going to talk to you about the confinement of these very high energy particles in Earth's uh, magnetic field. As Mona noted, for the last five decades, uh, we've been told in the textbooks that the Van Allen belts consist of two regions of trapped radiation, the inner stable zone, a slot region, and outer zone. What we found rather remarkable is just a couple of days after turning on our um, high energy electron detection instrumentation, that we really saw that there was a three belt structure um, and this persisted for four weeks and then really turned off. If I could have the first graphic, please. This is uh, several different energy channels displayed across in time. The vertical axis is essentially uh, distance measured out from the Earth in Earth radii. And if you uh, do the next uh, graphic click here, you'll see that we saw the inner belt, we saw the uh, expected slot region, and then we saw this new emergence of a, of a third belt and a, gap, a second gap region, a second slot. If we go on to the next slide, uh, or the next animation really, I'd just like to tell you that the Relativistic Electron Proton Telescope was put onto the spacecraft. You see the integration process here. It was really uh, geared toward measuring the highest energy particles uh, confined uh, in the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And what our goal was, was to really be able to measure to higher energies with better energy resolution, better temporal resolution, better spatial resolution, in order to um, address these very long-standing questions about how particles are accelerated and lost from the Van Allen belts. If we could have the next uh, graphic, please. Um, a mo further motivation for us um, was the long run of data that we had from another NASA mission called the Solar Anomalous Magnetospheric Particle Explorer, SAMPEX. This was launched in 1992. It made measurements in low Earth orbit. It was really not in operating in the throat of the uh, cosmic accelerator that operates in our neighborhood. But it was uh, really revealing the uh, inner belt, the outer belt, the slot region uh, over a long period of time. We learned early in the summer of 2012 that the SAMPEX mission was going to come to an end. Atmospheric drag was going to bring the spacecraft down and cause its demise sometime in the fall of 2012. And so what we really, we went on a campaign to try to turn on our instrument, uh, the REPT instrument, as early as we possibly could after launch. In the normal flow of commissioning that uh, Mona talked about, we would have turned on about 34 days after launch. We really uh, were able to turn on two days after launch, and uh, we were very fortunate that we did because if we go to the next slide, 
Uh, what we saw when we first turned on was that the uh, belt had the two-belt structure as we expected. And then as time marched on, we saw this emergence of three belts. And the lower panel really shows here the uh, kind of collapse of all the orbits onto a single meridional plane. And as you uh, watch this, you can see that this third belt emerges pretty clearly. And then, like a knife edge, the entire outer Van Allen belt is ripped away. And then there's a new emergence of this. And I'll just ask that we go through this again so you can see that uh, uh, sequence again. Here we are seeing the single storage ring feature, as we call it. And then we see the entire outer belt uh, outside that storage ring undergoing all kinds of dynamics. But these, this storage ring, or torus, is just there very persistently and unchanging for the better part of four weeks. We first foolishly thought the instruments were not working correctly, but we uh, quickly realized that that couldn't be true. It had to be a real phenomenon. We've been studying that now. If I could have the next slide, I'd just like to um, show you uh, then an animation that's been put together by scientists uh, here at the uh, Applied Physics Laboratory that, in which we've assimilated the data into um, the models and are now up. think that there are so many mysteries still in the radiation belts is because they are home to a host of fundamental physics processes that are occurring throughout our universe. Um, the same uh, physics that causes the particles to be accelerated in the Earth's radiation belts also causes radiation belts to occur at uh, all of the large magnetized planets in our solar system. So Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus all have radiation belt structures very similar to the Earth. Even outside our solar system, um, particle acceleration is also causing distant nebula to glow in X-rays. So, um, as we say, you know, it's, it's, it's just rocket science. It's just particle acceleration. It's the same thing that's happening um, here is, is happening everywhere. Um, and we're very lucky that we have this region of interest just a few thousand kilometers above our head. It's really rather like having your very own particle accelerator in the backyard. Um, what also, for me, makes this uh, event even more interesting is, that, as Mona uh, spoke of initially, um, the sun drove that large uh, storm that actually caused uh, the beautiful event uh, to be kicked off. And as we show here, um, SDO also can, uh, caught the event that, uh, that actually caused the annihilation of the radiation belt. So that knife edge that Dan showed, um, where you see the outer belt almost disappearing, was also driven by our, our star, the sun, um, always the star of the show. So the, the sun giveth and the sun taketh away. And uh, one of the central themes of the radiation belt storm probes mission is to really see why the radiation belts respond in such different ways to seemingly similar events coming from the sun. And the only way that we can really do that is to um, really take a system approach and look at the everything coming from the sun to, uh, to our Earth's space. And so this animation uh, shows nicely how the radiation belt storm probes, or the Van Allen probes, um, have now taken their place in the Heliophysics Observatory. So you're seeing a fleet of spacecraft in all the key locations um, between the sun and all the way to, to Earth. What makes the radiation belt storm probes so um, important is that they really have taken their place here. They are designed and developed to go after the physics that is occurring in the radiation belts. So they will really be providing those much needed uh, observations so we can um, decide uh, what's really happening in the radiation belts. Um, 
Also on board uh, the, the spacecraft, we have a comp full complement of instruments. So in addition to the highest quality particle measurements that have ever been uh, made that, that Dan has already showed, we also have fields and waves instruments. So uh, we're now going to, to study all of the wave structures uh, that are maybe responsible for causing that third belt and eroding that center part in the outer radiation belt, which we've termed the second slot region. So we're very you know, looking forward to these great new capabilities we have, not only providing discoveries, but also providing explanation as to why these phenomena are occurring. And also, as, as Mona said, the, um, the practical nature of the, the effects here at Earth, they are uh, causing dramatic changes in our near-Earth space, which have effects on life and society. Uh, we live and work in the radiation belts, and all our technology is based there. So understanding how the radiation belts change is extremely critical um, for our technolo technological infrastructure. Um, so in addition to the, the wonderful science that we, we have with the, the storm probes, um, we're also sending down real-time data, real-time space weather data that comes down and is captured through a network of ground stations um, and then is, is available within about 30 minutes um, on the web. And obviously scientists are very excited about these raw data, but uh, we understand that they're not always accessible to the general public. So um, we actually feed them into to models. One really good example is the dream model which is run out of Los Alamos National Laboratory um, and we are in the process now of feeding our real-time data into this model and uh, within the next three months we will be delivering that to uh, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center um, where they'll be using it uh, to, to better forecast space weather and that's a, a good segue to pass on to, to Joe Kunches from uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center to tell us all about space weather. Thank you Nikki. Uh, discoveries from missions such as the Van Allen probes are really the wellspring from which improvements to operational space weather services come. And let me take you into the, uh, the forecast office of the Space Weather Prediction Center here in a minute and show you what it's like to do operational space weather forecasting. This is the forecast office from NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We monitor space weather and we make the predictions that people want to, to plan from. We coordinate our activities with the U.S. Air Force. They have their own center at Offutt Air Force Base. And we're the World Warning Agency for 14 countries. The International Space Environment Service is, is focused at Boulder. Uh, among the data that are used there, along with the, set, the GOES data from, from NOAA, also you'll see NASA data from SDO, from ACE, from STEREO, from SOHO. And also those data feed into models. Here is the Enlil model from the solar wind that we get. And it enables the forecasters to make the best assessment of the current conditions and allows them to give good predictions of the conditions in the near future. In the next slide, I'll show you how one of the ways at which we get the word out from, from in real time as conditions occur. This is a graph showing in white the progress of the current solar cycle, and in blue the number of subscribers to our email product subscription service. Now it numbers more than 32,000 subscribers. Uh, of those subscribers, about 9,500 characterize themselves as having something to do with satellites. Either they are designers, they're engineers, they're manufacturers, they're operators. So clearly the satellite community is a very important community for us to serve with the best real-time space weather information that we can garner. Now, to focus for a minute on the satellite community, this probably comes as no surprise to anyone, but in the next slide, here's a, a chart from the Satellite Industry Association which shows the revenues uh, over about the last five years. This goes back to 2006. 2011 is the last full year for which the data are available. And what you can see uh, without looking too hard is that it's growth 9% on, about on average over the last five years. But also the last year is about $177 billion worth of revenues, further underscoring the fact that this is a very important customer base that needs the best space weather information they can get. And finally, just to maybe wrap it up, what is it about the space environment and, and space weather that causes disruptions to satellites? And this really goes to the activities that the Van Allen probes are designed to do. 
it's charged particles. And on the next slide, there's a, an illustration of the kinds of things that can happen to satellites by virtue of, say, low energy electrons, which can do 